Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Borg Warner. Feel good about driving. Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by Dow Automotive Systems, improving durability and increasing design flexibility with Betamate structural adhesives at DowBetamate.com. Hello and welcome to AutoLine Daily. We're glad that you joined us for today's report. Audi just announced it is going to be the first automaker to offer 4G LTE connectivity in cars in the North American market. General Motors thought it was going to be the first with this technology, but Audi is actually beating it to the market with the new A3. GM will have it available as standard equipment on a number of vehicles later in this model year. It will ultimately spread to all GM vehicles, at least those with a big enough display screen. The advantage of this technology is that it can transform a car into an internet hotspot with a high-speed connection for multiple smartphones, tablets, or laptops. And GM's MyLink system will now feature popular apps such as Pandora that will stream media into the vehicle through that 4G LTE connection. Automakers are desperate to tap into this connectivity because it represents a new revenue stream. Audi is working with AT&T and will charge $500 for a 30-month plan. GM is working through OnStar, but no word yet on what it will charge for these services. There are far more features to the system than what we've listed here. Click on today's show notes to learn what else is available. India is one of the developing markets that's attracting a lot of attention from automakers right now. Even though sales are down sharply this year, off nearly 11%, automakers are still very bullish on the long-term prospects for this market. But who are the major players? Well, Maruti, with its joint venture partner Suzuki, dominates the Indian market. For the first two months of the year, it sold nearly 200,000 vehicles. The second and third spots are held by Mahindra and Hyundai, with each of them just selling just under 70,000 vehicles. It sure is impressive to see how well Hyundai is positioned there. Then comes Tata, which once hoped its low-cost nano model would take the Indian market by storm, but so far has been a failure. Honda and Toyota round out the list with about 30,000 and 20,000 vehicles sold apiece. With a population of 1.2 billion people, automakers are hoping that someday India becomes as big a market as China. Delta Wing Technologies is the name of the company run by racing tycoon Don Panos. You'll remember that this is the company that bought the rights to the Delta Wing race car designed by Ben Bowlby, which Nissan raced two years ago at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Today, Panos is suing Nissan, which is coming out with a similar looking version of the car in both racing and road trim. No word yet on how that lawsuit is proceeding, but Delta Wing Technologies just added several very interesting people to its board of directors. That includes Margot Oge, formerly with the US EPA, where she was the director of the Office of Transportation and Air Quality. It includes Tom Wallace, former chief engineer on the Chevrolet Corvette and Via Lee for GM's performance cars. And it includes Al Spire, the former director of motorsports at Bridgestone Firestone. Delta Wing Technologies wants to come out with its own street legal version of this car. And so those are some pretty astute people for Don Panos to bring on board. As we keep reporting, propane powered vehicles are starting to catch on in the US. Last week, UPS announced that it's buying 1,000 Freightliner trucks that run on propane. And now, just to show you that the propane revolution continues to roll along, FedEx, along with Roush Cleantech, unveiled the delivery company's first ground vehicle that's powered by propane. It's a Ford F-59 that will operate in the Buffalo, New York area. The owner says he expects less than a three-year return on that investment and he expects to save over $25,000 in fuel costs. Hey, coming up next, it's time for You Said It. Dow Automotive Systems, driving solutions in automotive, commercial transportation, and aftermarket with innovative products like Betamate structural adhesives. Lighter, stronger, safer, DowBetamate.com. And now it's time for some of your feedback. 
Bradley saw our report that the new Chevrolet Suburban and GMC Yukon XL no longer have removable third row seats because they were stolen so often. He wants to know, stealing a third row seat? Where is the market for third row seats? Can you buy a Suburban with only two rows and put a third row in it? Well, the market for stolen third row seats is created by crackheads who need to make some quick bucks for a quick fix. And so they sell those seats to unscrupulous repair shops that are fixing damaged vehicles. That's why the new Suburban has a fold flat rear seat that cannot be easily removed. Now you can add a third row seat, even if it did not come from the factory with one, but you have to get the proper mounting brackets, which you can find on eBay for anywhere from $80 to $160. Buzzard heard us say that the one reason why the Chevy Silverado is not selling as well as it should is that the styling of the new one makes it hard to differentiate from the old one. So he goes on to ask, how does the Chevy Silverado redesign get the green light from the GM brass, who are supposed to be the experts, when pretty much all of us nobodies can recognize that they haven't changed the styling enough to entice people into the showroom? Buzzard, I'm sure they must have had big debates inside GM Design about this one. And someone must have decided that pickup buyers are more interested in the capabilities of a truck than in its styling. And since they love the old design, the thinking probably went, there was no need to change or at least not change it very much. I'm sure they're kicking themselves about this, and I expect to see a quick styling fix sometime next year. Benny knows that we keep saying the propane revolution is getting underway for commercial trucks in the U.S., but he wants to know, is propane as good as natural gas, proposed by T. Boone Pickens, or is that essentially the same thing? Well, there's really only one big difference. Natural gas has to be stored at around 3,000 PSI, while propane is stored at around 250 PSI. That's a huge difference in pressure, and that has a big impact on cost, especially from an infrastructure standpoint. So a typical natural gas station for a truck fleet will cost about a million dollars, but a propane station will cost only $50,000. And if you buy it in bulk prices, propane can be significantly cheaper than natural gas. Even so, with big oil money and people like T. Boone behind natural gas, it is getting all the headlines. Kit Gerhardt wants to know, how separate are VW's different brands? Audi seems to be working very well. In fact, with the exception of Seat, all of VW's brands are doing well overall. And they are quite separate with their own boards of directors, their own annual reports, their own design and engineering staff, and in most cases, their own manufacturing plants. VW AG is probably the most decentralized of the major automakers. And as I keep saying, decentralization allows for more agility and agility is what keeps you ahead of the competition. And finally, to Chris, to Cross heard us report that Cadillac's new marketing CMO, Uwe Ellinghaus, who came from BMW, would like to dump the alphabet soup of car names that Cadillac uses. He asks, if Cadillac dumps their alphabet soup, does that mean we can see the return of the Brome? Hey, don't laugh, it could happen, but I would expect to see names like Eldorado, Fleetwood, and DeVille. Hey, thanks for all your letters and comments. We truly do like getting them. And before we go, don't forget, we've got a great AutoLine After Hours coming up tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll let you in on some of the design secrets that are needed to pass today's crash standards. But that wraps up today's report. Thanks for watching, and please join us again tomorrow.